Hello, welcome to lesson two for the Hidden Life of Stars. Um, in this lesson, we will take a look at the night sky and try to understand how we label things in the night sky, um, how we move through the sky, and talk about why we have seasons. Um, we will also get into some of the interesting um, phenomena that we observe, such as solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. So um, follow along and let me know if I can answer any questions for you. Let's take a look at the night sky and see what we can discover about our place in the universe. So if you're in the desert or out of the ocean, um, someplace where you have very dark skies, you'll be able to see about 2,000 stars overhead. And you'll also see a very bright band um, of stars that kind of makes the sky look milky. And that's our galaxy, um, the Milky Way galaxy. And as you watch the sky, the night sky, you will see that the stars will rise from the east and that they will set in the west. So this is a scene filmed in Death Valley, and you can see the Milky Way moving through the night sky. So when we look at the sky, it's nice to have a map so we can talk about different regions of the sky. And by international agreement, the sky is divided up into 88 constellations. So these constellations are areas of the sky that draw a map, um, very much like the state maps of the United States, where the borders may seem somewhat arbitrary, but every part of the sky lies within one of the constellations. So as you look at the sky, you may have noticed that it looks like you're surrounded by a large dome. And the ancients thought that that was truly the case. Um, we have very little depth perception as we look at the sky, so it looks like all of the stars are the same distance away, even though they vary in distance greatly. So we talk about a celestial sphere and the Earth being at the center of the celestial sphere. And we have some points on that sphere that we can define locations by. If you look at the North Pole of the Earth here, directly above the North Pole of the Earth is the North Celestial Sphere. Directly below the South Pole of the Earth is the South Celestial Sphere. And if you take our equator and project it out onto the Celestial Sphere, you will get the Celestial Equator. And we will come back to that and talk about how we talk about positions in the sky in just a second. So here then, if I look up at the sky, all of the stars appear on this celestial sphere. And I can say that the celestial sphere then is divided up into 88 regions, and those regions are the constellations. Um, the constellations are centered around familiar patterns of stars. Um, you may be familiar with Orion or Pisces or one of the other patterns. And if I take the orbit of the Earth around the sun here, then that traces out, the sun traces out a path on the celestial sphere, which is called the ecliptic. Notice that here is the celestial equator, and the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator at two points, and we'll come back to talk about that. So one of the things you'll notice as we look at the sky is that if different directions we see different things. Now we lie within the Milky Way galaxy. We're about two-thirds of the way out from the center of a spiral that our galaxy forms. And our galaxy kind of has the shape of a pancake with a slight bulge at the center. So you can imagine that if you look towards the center of the galaxy, you're going to see lots and lots of stars and lots and lots of dust because the galaxy is quite dense with stars. And so as you look towards the center of the galaxy, you, it's very hard to see beyond our galaxy because there's so much getting in the way. If you want to see other galaxies and stars outside of our galaxy, then you need to look outside of the plane of the galaxy. So if you're here on the outer edge and you look towards the center, you're going to see a lot of dust, a lot of local stars. If you look out of the galaxy going, say, up or down in this image, then you'll be able to see other galaxies and other stars. 
So when we look at the sky, we want a way to talk about where we're looking. So if we were to go out and look up at the sky and I wanted to point out a certain star, we'd need to have some common terms. So we're going to define a few directions in our sky. And since we're going to be standing um, somewhere here in Ohio or wherever you might be, um, we want to have a common language. So if we are standing here and I look straight over my head, so if I point straight up in the air, my finger will be pointing at what we call the zenith. Then if I take my finger and draw a great circle starting at that zenith through the North Pole, we'll call that the celestial meridian. So having those two points in mind, we have north, we have a zenith, and we have a celestial meridian, we can now talk about where to find a star. If I go to the north and I come to the east, then I am increasing my azimuth. So as I travel along my horizon, I am increasing my azimuth. Now the horizon is defined as 90 degrees below the zenith. Now, you may not be able to see your horizon because there may be trees or buildings or mountains in the way, but it is defined to be 90 degrees below the zenith. So if I come east along my horizon, then that is my azimuth, and then I go upwards towards my zenith from the horizon, and that's my altitude. So for instance, if I said I wanted you to observe a star that was 45 degrees azimuth and 45 degrees um, altitude, then you would come to face due east and then look 45 degrees up from your horizon. And we would be able to discuss then whatever that star was. So here, um, these distances in azimuth and altitude, we use angular distance. So we'll discuss angular distances here in a second. So we want to look at the sky. And if I tell you to look, say, 15 degrees in altitude, how do you know what 15 degree is? Well, your hand makes for a very good reference. If you hold your hand out at arm's length, your finger is about one degree in angular measure. If you hold up three fingers, that's about five degrees in angular measure. A fist is 10 degrees in angular measure. If you hold your thumb and your little finger spread out as far as you possibly can, that's about 25 degrees in angular measure if you're holding it out at arm's length. So what is angular measure? Well, we break a circle into 360 degrees. So there are 360 degrees in one full circle. In astronomy, quite often, we need to have smaller units of angular measure. So we break that degree up into 60 arc minutes. So one degree is 60 arc minutes, and one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. So how do you work with these types of units? Well, let's say I want to know how many arc seconds are in 30 degrees. Well, if I take 30 degrees times 60 arc minutes per degree, then that will give me the angle in arc minutes. And then if I multiply that by 60 arc seconds um, divided by one arc minute, then that gives me the angular measure in arc seconds. So give this a try. Why don't you pause the video here and answer the question, how many degrees are there in 18,000 arc seconds? Another useful property that we have in astronomy that helps us discover where things are and to measure things is something we call angular size. So I define angular size as being the physical size of the object, that's this small d here, divided by the distance from the observer, divided by this distance d. If you want that value in degrees, you will need to multiply by 360 degrees divided by 2 pi radians. So that is your angular size delta. And it doesn't matter how far away you are, um, this angular size can be quite different. So a good example is hold your finger up in front of your eye, very close to your eye, and notice how much of the field of vision is taken up by your finger. Now hold the same finger out at arm's length and notice how little of your field of vision is taken up by your finger. So as you get further away, you are decreasing the angular size of your finger. So here, since we're dealing with angles, we can look at a unit circle. And starting here on the horizon, and in mathematics, we tend to go counterclockwise. So if I start at the horizon, come straight up, that's 90 degrees. If I go to the other horizon, that's 180 degrees. 
and I can talk about the angular size of objects in the sky, in this case the moon, and the moon, drawn not to scale here, is one half a degree. So I can talk about the size of that in terms of its angular size, and that's going to be a very handy tool. So on the website and in Angel, we have a worksheet which has an example. So in that example, I walk you through how to work with angular measure. And then at the end of the example, um, there are three exercises. Make sure you take the time to do these exercises. Um, you are free to either type the solutions or photograph your solutions or scan your solutions, any way you can get them into a digital format and put those in the Dropbox for Lesson 2 on Angel. If you have any questions working through this worksheet, be sure to come to one of my office hours or ask me um, via email. So one of the things we discussed earlier is the stars rise in the east and they set in the west. So here, if I have my zenith straight overhead, so I'm standing here, say, in Ashland, Ohio, and I look straight up and I see my zenith, and then if I look towards the north star, that will be my north celestial pole. So if I look at Polaris, I see my north celestial pole, and I see stars here rise in the east and they set in the west. Now, if you've watched the sky, you may notice that there are some stars, like the Big Dipper or the Cassiopeia here in Ohio, that never set. And as you see, they orbit around the celestial pole. So as they orbit around the celestial pole, they never drop below my horizon. Stars that are always above the horizon we call circumpolar stars. Notice there are some stars in the Southern Hemisphere, like the Southern Cross, that we never get to see here in Ohio because they are circumpolar below our horizon. So we never get to those, see those stars. Notice there are several stars then that will rise above our horizon and then set below our horizon. So these stars are the stars we see rising and setting through the night. So as I stand here in Ohio, I see some stars never set, those are circumpolar, and I see some stars that rise in the east and set in the west as the Earth rotates. So in order to talk about where we're located on Earth, um, we break the Earth up into a grid. And we talk about the equator being the center, and if I look at my angular measure above the equator, those are latitude lines. So notice that as I come above the equator, um, northern Florida is at about 30 degrees. Um, the Canadian border is up just below 45 degrees and so forth up to the North Pole. I can have angular measure going south to the South Pole. So if I tell you your latitude, you know how far in angular measure you are up from the equator then we need to have lines going around the Earth, and we call those longitude lines. Now, it doesn't matter where we call zero longitude lines. It's completely arbitrary as long as everybody agrees. And by international treaty, we agree that zero degrees longitude, we call the prime meridian, goes through Greenwich, England, which was the Royal Naval Observatory, um, which set the time for the British Navy. So that is our prime meridian. As you move... Um, eastward from that, you increase your lines of longitude. So with that, we can look at if I'm at the North Pole and I'm at 90 degrees longitude, and notice if I look at the North Star, it's at 90 degrees from my horizon. If I'm standing here, say, in Ashland, Ohio, the North Pole, star is so far away that the light comes down at pretty much the same angle for me as it does at the equator. So I'm standing here at a certain latitude and if you work through these similar triangles this latitude angle is the same as the angle of the North Pole or the North Celestial Star and that is the same latitude that I would measure here. So if you want to know what your latitude is all you need to do is look at the Polaris or the North Star and measure its altitude in your sky and that altitude will be the same as your latitude. So as the Earth orbits the Sun, then the Sun's going to appear in various constellations. And the constellations that the Sun appears in will lie along our ecliptic. So if you look at the typical zodiac, you can trace out where the ecliptic is in the sky. So here then, um, if the Earth is 
looking at the sun. The sun's going to in this image lie in the zodiac or in the constellation of Cancer in this image. So going back to our previous image of the celestial sphere, as the Earth orbits the sun, the sun appears in these different regions. Here the sun is at the vernal equinox, so this is in the Pisces, coming from Pisces and Aries, or Aries into Pisces, and of course then in the night sky you would be seeing Virgo. So next we'll talk about why we have seasons, but for now, um, why don't you stop and do your angular measure exercise and we'll return to the videos in another lecture.